absolutely. That's yeah. That's 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 what this slide is for. Yeah. That'd be great. Cool. Um, so first of all, um, yeah. Good afternoon, Europe, and um, possibly good morning, United States, if they're joining us. Um, so I just firstly I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today. And this came out of uh, several of us from the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh attended a, a IIIF showcase hosted by the National Library of Scotland. And we then took the idea of IIIF working group and the ISTC joint meeting. And that actually, we should be looking more closely at and this webinar is the result of that decision. So this is um, partly through PCAF that this is happening. And it gives our, aims to give our community a basic introduction to IIIF and a demonstration of how it can be used for our images and resources. So, um, so we, I mean, our institute's been working hard to digitize millions of specimens. So we're now needing to find more innovative and effective ways of using these images for research. And the need for making it easier and faster for people to do biodiversity research is really greater than ever. And we're in an amazing position now in terms of the rapidly increasing availability of data and images online. And but we need to find ways to the best um, use of these resources. And we need to find tools and workflows to help us do that. <coughs> so we've been pulling together some potential case studies. Um, and what I'm going to do is just there's a few noises coming through, so I just and we're recording this. So could I ask anyone who's online to mute if you're not actually speaking, if you could mute your your connection, that would be great. Um, and if that if that's not possible, maybe the um, the host can maybe mute people as well. well I, I can do that. I'm gonna can I mute everyone? Great. <laughs> Uh, apart from you, obviously. Uh... So finally, I just want to say we've been pulling together some potential case studies, and some of these come from Hannah Wilson's work on her PhD here at RBGE. And these include comparing duplicate specimens, for example, annotating images with sequence data, creating composite images with specimens, maps, protologues, character icons for classifying and keying, and kind of two-way links to literature as well. So finally, we're, we're really lucky to have Tom Crane, who's the technical director of Digirati, a digital consultancy. And he's here to post and present this introduction to IIIF. And Tom was one of the editors of the IIIF specification. And Digirati have also worked with some samples of our images to present a short demonstration of how we could use IIIF for our, our um, images and resources. So I think you're going to really enjoy this, and I hope it's going to inspire you to explore IIIF further. And there's going to be some time for questions and discussions at the end of the presentation. So it'd be great if anyone's got any thoughts for possible next steps for this as well. And if you want, um, you can put any questions and things into the chat. If you don't want to present the question yourself at the end, if you you can put them into chat, and I'll I'll ask the question for you. And so now I'm going to hand over to Tom Crane for the presentation. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Elspeth. Can you can you still hear me? I haven't muted myself by mistake there. No, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. And also, you can still see the slide, and you can't see anything else on that screen other than the slide. Um, I can see a grey box. A grey box. Oh, okay, that must be... But I'm the only one that can see that. Uh, yeah, you've just moved the grey boxes. Okay, all right, yeah, that's the bits and pieces of the uh, WebEx UI. Okay. Thanks. But you can still you can see the slide now. Okay, so I'm going to launch into this presentation, and this presentation is really kind of from a cultural heritage context, which is the context that our work in IIIF has happened so far. Um, but you'll see that the same arguments about metadata apply to other other areas of uh, research, presentation of material. So we need to meet someone else there, I think. Uh, Okay. 
Right, um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to talk about what happens when you go into a, a library. And, uh, uh, there's a lot of background noise. <laughs> Can anyone else hear that noise? Yes, I think it's it's Mike. Um, if Mike, if you could mute yourself, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, where do I do that? Oh, there we go. I've, I've yeah. muted you. Thank you. Okay, cool. Right. So, when we when we engage with a, a library, uh, we could we could go and look at the semantic metadata that describes the books. Uh, and here I've represented that in a rather archaic way as a card index. But we could also uh, just wander around the library and look at things. The, the semantic information, the descriptive metadata about objects that have been digitized, isn't a requirement for us to look at them or enjoy them. We can just go in and wander around. And the way the content is arranged in physical space is, is also determined by, by, by that metadata. But we don't need those cards to enjoy the stuff. Similarly, when we pick up a book and read it, or look at uh, a, a gallery uh, card on, a, on, a, on, on the wall of a gallery, we don't necessarily need that to understand what we're looking at. We can see from the cover of the book, for example, who the author is, what the title of the book is, who the publisher is, what that publisher's logo is, what image they've chosen to represent that book. All these kinds of pieces of descriptive metadata are just things that we, 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 we get because we're humans interacting with the world. Um, and this kind of seems like an obvious thing. Um, and we can use our presentation API, our human understanding of presentation API, to pick the right book from the shelves, to go to the right part of the library. We can use it when that descriptive semantics is used to organize content for us in information architecture on a website, for example. We still, we can, you know, we're not interacting with the descriptive metadata directly. We're just being presented with the results of that descriptive metadata, and we're picking up objects, reading books, interacting with objects in the world as human beings. So, um, as I said, this is kind of a statement of the obvious. You know, we don't need to look at the card index to wander around a library and understand what, as a human being, we're looking at. Because we have this kind of cultural awareness that we've, that we've uh, inherited from our understanding of what book covers and gallery labels mean. Now, when we're actually interacting with digitized content on the web, we still have this cultural awareness. And if we see a digitized object, uh, on screen. We understand what it is, but the computer needs a bit of assistance in presenting that digital surrogate of a physical object to me. Because as a human being, I can pick up a book and I know which way to hold it up, and I know which way the pages go, I know whether it reads left to right or right to left, I know what the table of contents is and what the index is. I understand these concepts, but if a piece of software is helping me read that book, it needs some metadata itself to present the object to me if it's a complex object. Uh, and even if it's a single painting, it might need, you know, the information might be the front and the back panels or different multispectral views of the image. Uh, this is stuff that as a human I can sort out, but a computer needs assistance in presenting it to me. It needs some sort of metadata, not to convey the meaning of the object, but to drive a viewing experience so that our human cultural understanding can take over again. And this kind of process has happened throughout the history of digitization. So for the last 20 and more years, libraries and museums have been digitizing their collections. And each library and museum comes along and they get a grant and they digitize part of their catalog and they put it online and they build a viewer and they put an interesting collection up and someone else does, puts another interesting collection up and someone else puts another one up. And this process goes on and on and on. And people have been doing this for so long that you have hundreds, if not thousands, in fact, definitely thousands of silos, effectively, of digitized collections that we can all understand and interact with individually, but they can't interact with each other because the way they have been modeled and presented to the world is non interoperable They're, they're just silos of, of content. And so the, you know, the, the a, a digitization program uh, undertaken by the British Library or the Bodleian Library may produce a whole load of interesting content. And then that content is just going to sit there in a silo and, you know, when the grant money runs out and just sit there kind of gathering digital dust, looking more and more out of date, looking more and more kind of uh, stranded in a, a 1990s looking website or an early 2000s looking website or a, or a 10 year old viewer or a page turner because the technology on which each of them is built is you know, soon obsolete. So. This is obviously a problem, and people can get around these kinds of problems by making standards so that we can share the way we do things with each other 
uh, and start to make interoperable content. So if we, went, if we started going about making a standard for solving this problem, for making digitized resources interoperable, what would we do? You know, we could say, okay, well, there's so many standards we can choose from, and we, we can always make another one. What are the things we need to make a standard? We need to make sure the pages are in the right order and that the standard, the metadata of the standard conveys structure so we can have navigation around the book and what order the pages go in. And we definitely want to be able to deep zoom into the digitized image because we spent so much on the high resolution images. We want to get right into the grain of the paper or whatever. And we need some extra metadata so we can associate our, our digitized objects with information about you know, who, who wrote it and that kind of stuff. Things that need to be presented along with the, the digitized object. Uh, the title and the author and the subject, which of our collections the book lives in. And then we start getting into the kind of, oh, this is getting more into, into what we, information we have already in our catalogs. Uh, we could start to use this information to describe our objects in more, more general terms. Um, so for one institution, might decide that it's really important to put the binding material of a book into the description of a book that goes out as, dig as a digitized object into the world. But then we start running into problems because our metadata that we need starts ballooning into all sorts of complex domains. And then we have to ask ourselves questions. Well, if we have an author field in our metadata, our standard that we're going to adopt the digitized objects, does a painting have an author? And then we think, okay, well, this problem must have been solved already. So we go and look at other standards from other domains. So we'll look at the CRM, the CDOC CRM. And we start realizing that describing cultural heritage objects in all their glory is a complicated business. And we, we add more and more features to our descriptive model so that more and more institutions' objects can be described by it. And we end up with far too much information. We've kind of, we're trying to solve too many problems at once. Our standard is, is confusing what's important about getting pixels onto the screen. So what happened? What happened in that explosion of complexity in our model? It started off really well. We were modeling, uh, you know, we, our, our data was looking really good about how to, how to have an interoperable standard for freeing all the content from the silos. But then it got more and more complex. Something went wrong. People started arguing with each other. Uh, I think it might have gone wrong when someone said the word author. So, and that kind of problem illustrates what, you know, the, the, the challenge that faces us in producing interoperable digital objects, that there are so many ways to describe things and so many ways that people want to describe their things. And that's just from the cultural heritage domain. Um, from other domains, from scientific domains, medicine, there are going to be all sorts of other models that people are going to, are going to want to associate with their digitized objects uh, that need to accompany them out in the world as interoperable objects. So, what's IIIF got to do with this? What IIIF does is try and solve this problem a different way by providing two core APIs. And the first of them is the image API, and that provides pixels. Uh, and we'll look at that in more detail in a second. But the most important of them for interoperability is this thing called the presentation API. And the box I've highlighted is really the key to understanding what IIIF is and what IIIF is not. The presentation API is just enough metadata to drive a remote viewing experience and no more. And I'll explain what that means in a second. There's two other APIs associated with IIIF that, are, that help us provide rich experiences on our digitized material. They are the search API um, for finding content and the authentication API for protecting images that need to be protected. I'll go into them in a bit more detail later. But back to the presentation API, we were talking about descriptive metadata and we were looking at the differences between descriptive metadata and presentation metadata. And basically IIIF ignores all the descriptive metadata because that doesn't help us put pixels on the screen for people to look at. The point of the presentation API is to allow us to read pages, look at brush strokes, see film grain, but not necessarily to understand that the author of this work is person A and that they were born in such and such a place and the book was published at such and such a time. Those are semantic descriptions of the object that don't actually help get the pixels on screen. They help our understanding of it in other ways, but they're not involved in sharing and putting the image on screen. And so what IIIF provides is a model for describing digital representations of objects. And that same model, when exchanged and consumed by software, is basically a, a, a format for that software to 
render the digital objects to a viewer in a rich viewing environment. And that content could be the images of a digitized book, and it could be annotations made on that work. It could be uh, a website that's displaying a book, or a viewer that's displaying a book, or a painting, or uh, um, all sorts of other media. Um, um, so if we ignore the descriptive metadata, does that mean that we're going to lose all that important contextual information? Well, so here's a IIIF viewer uh, that's rendering a, a book from the National Library of Wales. And you can see there on the right-hand side, there's plenty of descriptive metadata present. Um, the, the API allows that information to be carried through to be rendered by a viewer, but the the model, the IIIF model, doesn't define what that metadata is. It's just name value pairs um, with multi-language uh, multi support, but essentially metadata that is there to be displayed to a human is opaque to the IIIF uh, spe um, specification. It doesn't, m it doesn't mind what that is. It doesn't care what that is. It's all it's interested in is getting the pages in the right order and showing the work and showing all the content associated work with the work, all the text annotations and commentary and transcriptions and links to other references and links to articles and commentary about the work, all that kind of stuff is important content for it. But it doesn't need to understand what it means. It just needs to get it on screen for, to be interoperable. So we have this model called the Presentation API, and this is an extremely simplified picture of it. Um, and it Basically, at the heart of it is this thing called a manifest. And a IIIF manifest is a format, a, a model, a piece of data that describes a particular work. Um, and that could be a whole book, or it could be a single painting, or it could be a collection of specimens, or it could be one specimen. Uh, but the manifest is the kind of logical unit that goes out in the world that you publish to be rendered by a compatible IIIF viewer. Um, and a manifest comp is comprised of a sequence of uh, canvases, and we'll get on to what a canvas means in a second. And that, what I'm going to do very briefly, just to, just to dispel any misunderstandings, is show you what a manifest looks like. Can you see on the screen now we have a slightly different view? This is, a, this is one of many hundreds of thousands of manifests from the Wellcome Library. Uh, here you can see this descriptive metadata, but that in the API is just name value pairs. We don't care what it actually means. It just gets rendered to us in, the, in a viewer. And we can see here that this, this is just a huge chunk of JSON data that just provides enough information about images to put them all in the right order. And that's enough, that's enough curly braces. That's all the, all, the, all, the, all the code you'll ever see. Um, so I'm just going to go back to the slideshow. Um, so we have this idea that an institution is publishing this thing called a manifest, which conforms to the IIIF model, which describes a work, which could be an extremely complex work, or it could be a very simple work. And it describes it in enough detail for us to consume it in a viewer as a viewing experience and annotate it and make sure we see the images in the right order, um, but not conveying anything other than that. So. The manifest is the thing, and that thing could be a book, or a movie, or an audio file, or a photograph of a specimen, or a painting, or you know, any, any kind of object that we can represent di digitally. Um, and within the manifest, we have one or more views of that content. Um, now, usually, if we think of the, what the word annotation means in the context of digitized objects, we think of something like this. We think of a picture. Uh, where people have come along and maybe drawn boxes around particular areas and made comments about them, or drawn a box around an area and made a transcription of it, or linked the image to some other piece of content. And this is kind of the model in IIIF, but there's an extra layer of abstraction in IIIF. And in IIIF, the canvas itself is this empty space onto which the image content is also an annotation. So we have this concept in IIIF where the thing we're all talking about, say in this case a page of a manuscript, is represented out there in the world by this abstract space called a canvas. And a canvas is 
you can think of it like a PowerPoint slide that you haven't put anything on yet. So if you imagine an empty PowerPoint slide on which you can put an image piece of content and a text piece of content and various other pieces of content. The canvas is the, the kind of heart of the IIIF model um, because it allows us to, to make statements about the object that our digitized representation is, is a representation of um, independently of particular image representations of it. And the reason we can do that is because the images we, themselves are also annotations. So in this picture here, we're seeing that the dotted line represents this abstract space uh, called a canvas. And we're providing three annotations on, of it, or on it. One of them provides the image content. One of them is a comment. And one of them is a transcription. And if at a later date we got ourselves a better image of this material, we could also add that to this abstract space. Um, annotations can be used for all sorts of things. In this picture, we're seeing annotations being used to transcribe the text. So this, in this case, the annotations are coming from an OCR process. And we can see that the OCR process has identified lots of boxes on this screen. Uh, and um, each box uh, is um, accompanied by a piece of text. And we can see in this particular IIIF compatible viewer that we can hover over that text and, and see what the text is. Um, when we digitize a whole book, we're effectively putting out there in the world, in our IIIF model, a sequence of empty canvases. And we're providing each canvas with at least one image. And so our canvases are in the right order. And each canvas acquires an image, a piece of content. And then a viewer will take that manifest with its sequence of canvases, each annotated by an image, and render it in whatever way it is appropriate could render it in a kind of uh, a page turning book reader interactive experience. It could re re render it in a very flat experience as a, on a web page. It could render it in all sorts of ways, but it has the information required to construct a viewing experience for us through this mechanism of annotation by associating images with these abstract spaces. And the point about this is that if everyone does it that way, if everyone publishes these abstract entities called canvases and links image content to them through annotation, it means that everyone's talking about the same kind of space when they, when they publish um, a, a, a manifest. And we could do something interesting with that. Supposing we had a medieval manu uh, manuscript that had been torn up or, or you know, dismembered sometime in the past. And it, it exists only in parts. And each of those parts is uh, at a separate institution. So one is uh, at the British Library, uh, one is at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, one is somewhere else, maybe in Edinburgh. Um, and each of those institutions has digitized all their materials so, and, and published them as IIIF resources. Um, and they're available as IIIF images. And what that means is that because they're all available via the same standard, we could publish our own canvas and annotate onto that canvas the parts from the various places. So in this, I mean, this is a contrived example, but people have done this for real. And we are going to share some examples of that later. People have reconstructed medieval manuscripts in this way. Uh, in this example, we can see that our three image sources from around the world are being recombined digitally on this single abstract canvas, like this empty PowerPoint slide. And we're still missing a piece. And we don't know where that is. But we could still provide content on our abstract canvas for that piece, because we could make another annotation that isn't an image annotation, but is a commentary annotation, a piece of text. And we could maybe provide a transcription of that missing piece, even though we can't provide an image for it. And because everyone is using the same standard to share this material, we can recombine it and make new objects and new collections from around the world and combine them into new manifests and publish those manifests. And then people can see see this kind of recombination, uh, you know, the distributed nature of the web and the distribu distributed nature of collections that people want to collaborate on come together quite nicely so that we can combine things in single viewing experiences. Examples of these are things like reconstructing manuscripts, as we can see here, but also reconstructing exchanges of letters. So for example, if one institution holds the letters 
uh, of uh, Francis Crick, so the Wellcome Library in London holds the letters of Francis Crick, and the National Library of Medicine in uh, Maryland in the States has the correspondence of James Watson. Then we can look at interesting correspondence between them and recombine it in a viewer because both those institutions are providing that material as IIIF um, re resources. So we can construct new manifests to illustrate particular exchanges of letters. And we do that through the process of constructing new IIIF resources and annotating the information onto them. Um, and you know, I've been talking about annotations. And annotations can be used for any kind of purpose. You could say, why is this object in this exhibition? Uh, here is a link to a blog post about this painting. Here, there's a missing bit of this video, but we have some production skill, uh, stills and some screenplay, uh, and we can annotate those onto our, onto our abstract space instead of the moving image and still allow us to convey some idea of what the movie is about. We could translate particular pieces of text via a mechanism of annotation. We could link to an essay about something through annotation. We could write a transcript of a letter or link to an article. All these mechanisms are done through annotation. And just like IIIF, annotation is a, a, a standard. There's a W3C standard, the Web Annotation Data Model, um, and that acts as the foundation of IIIF. And it's this shared distributed model of annotation that is allowing us to share resources in this way. And at the moment, we have 2D materials. So I've mentioned in passing uh, movies um, but in fact, IIIF today, if you look at the published specifications, is really about 2D static images. Uh, but many institutions have other content. They have audio and video content um, and want to be able to share that content too and make that interoperable and also make that available as targets for other people to annotate. And so what's happening now in IIIF is that we're looking to add a time dimension to our abstract canvases and allow people to add content uh, in time as well as space. Uh, and I can give a demo of that at the end if uh, you're interested. So I'll just skip past that. So we mentioned, we were talking about the presentation API so far, which is what is being used to convey the structure of, a, of, of an object. Um, but we also have this image API, because one of the things that people are really keen on uh, in sharing cultural heritage objects is being able to zoom into them and also to extract particular crops, regions at particular sizes from those um, images. And what I'm going to do here is um, just give you a brief indication of what that means. So here, oops, that's not the right thing. So here we have, can you, can you see the screen? Can everyone see the screen now? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. So we have this image API, and what that means is that for every single image that an institution publishes as a IIIF image API endpoint, we can interact with that image and attach parameters to it to extract particular parts of it. Um, and here we're looking at an image from the Wellcome Library. Uh, it's a, a fantastic painting that's actually about 12 foot, um, or three meters, three or four meters wide. Um, but I can, I can ask for a particular region of this image by specifying a particular set of coordinates. And I want that image at a particular size. Or I could say, actually, the image has been, I want to distort it for some reason because I want to investigate a particular part of it in a different way. So I could ask for now, uh, I'm, I'm constraining the size to 600 by 600 pixels by changing this parameter in the URI. This, this part here is a, is a URL. I can say, uh, actually, I don't want to distort it. I just want it confined to a particular box at 600 by 600 pixels. Uh, or I want to rotate it because uh, I, want to see, I want to see some detail of it that's uh, better looked at at 90 degrees. So I'm adding in a 90 degree param parameter to the rotation slot. Or I want it mirrored because maybe the image is uh, a, a negative uh, and I want to uh, invert it. Or I want to look at it in a different kind of quality. So here, grayscale and an image, uh, image API endpoints can provide different formats, for example, bitonal and you know, dithered and other, other, other kinds of uh, qualities. 
And so if you're an institution like the Wellcome Library, for each of the 30 million images that you publish, you, could, you can provide a triple I of image API endpoint, which allows people to extract whatever region of the image they need for their particular purpose. And one thing, one side effect of this, and in fact one kind of motivating side effect of it, is the ability to request tiles. Um, now what that means is that just as we can uh, request arbitrary regions, we can also request particular tiles from the image. And in the same way that uh, a mapping, uh, a, a tile-based mapping service works by loading in just the information you need, just the tiles you need for the area of the world that you're looking at, at the right zoom level that you're looking at, the right scale. You know, if you're looking at Google Maps, you don't need to load in the entire world to look at your neighborhood. You only need the data around the current viewport at the right scale. And having an image server that can deliver tiles allows a client to ask for just those tiles at just the right size. So we can start off with small tiles but not very far zoomed in, and we can get all the way down into very, very deep zoom tiles. Um, and what that allows us to do when combined with annotations is do things like, uh, let's have a look at our examples again. If I go back to here. We can, uh, for example, uh, here we have deep zoom in action and we have multiple annotations on the canvas. So this is the same painting, but uh, around about a year ago, this painting was featured in an exhibition in London uh, about the, the life of John Dee, who is this, you know, effectively an, an alchemist. He was uh, uh, in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. And when this painting was x-rayed for this exhibition, it was found that uh, in a, it had been overpainted and around the floor, around John Dee, was this layer of this ring of skulls. And this was only revealed when the uh, painting was x-rayed. And, and by combining uh, these two images together and annotating them onto the same canvas uh, as a choice of uh, images annotated onto this abstract space that represents the painting, we can convey this to, a, to an end user. Here we've decided on a particular user interface treatment, but we could, we could adopt a different user interface treatment. Say, for example, here's one that has a kind of magnifying glass kind of, oh, something's going wrong with my, magnifying glass kind of approach. Uh, yeah, so you can see here that we're getting the skulls um, but this kind of stuff is achieved by having the notion of this abstract space that represents the painting onto which we can annotate all these different multispectral views. And so when combined with the presentation API, we end up with uh, complex digital objects accompanied by extremely rich image services that allow us for every single view on those objects to do interesting and complicated things with images at, at a really high resolution level. But at the same time, we can c consume large quantities of this material in viewers because the, the tiling nature of the image servers allows, it, allows them to serve us small thumbnails and small versions of images. So we can, we can kind of get the benefit of having extremely high resolution resources available to us in a complex structure by combining deep zooming capability of the image API with the rich descriptive uh, structural presentation information of the presentation API. I'm just going to continue for a second with to look very briefly at the other two APIs, one of which is search. And we can see in this example uh, just, a, just an image of uh, a IIIF viewer doing a search. Um, if a IIIF resource provides a search service, then anyone can come up to that, to, to that manifest, say, in a compatible IIIF viewer and perform a search on that content. Um, and that allows us to find text content of image-based resources. Obviously, the institution that publishes that resource has to provide that search service, but it means that you can use different clients that understand how to interact with the standardized IIIF search API, and they can find the text content of the, of the digitized objects. So I can do the same search from a different client, uh, or I can use the same client from an, a different institution's material 
and the search just works. And similarly, you know, ideally all our content would be open, but some content can't be for various reasons. Uh, so we need to protect access to it. Now, if we do all our access control in a completely uh, non-standard way, then we can't build compatible clients that we can use to combine resources from multiple places because they won't understand all the different mechanisms of, of, of access control. And what the authentication API does is provide a kind of bridge from the IIIF world into your institutional authentication world to allow you to expose enough information for a client to know whether or not you can see the images and if you can't, what information to show you and where to take you to acquire the right credentials to see those images. And again, this means that you can have a manifest, say, that combines resources from multiple institutions, each with different access control policies, and the viewer can kind of guide you through the process of acquiring the right credentials to see all those different pieces of material. So these four APIs together allow us to uh, view images by serving pixels, describe digital objects by serving presentation API manifests to describe their structure. They allow us to search annotations and they allow us to protect content that can't be open, open access. Now, I'm, what I'm going to do very briefly is just go and look at some annotations in more detail because um, everyone has interesting models of the world that they want to represent um, in a manifest, and um, we also want to make statements about those things through the mechanism of annotation. So I'm just going to show you some examples, and then we'll look at uh, some material from uh, the Royal Botanical Garden to see how we might apply these annotation principles to that material. So here I have an example of a transcription annotation, and it's just a piece of content that I could publish anywhere I could, you know, I could just come up to your content in a compatible annotation tool and make this statement. And if you're offering me a place to save it, I can save it back to you, or I can save it myself somewhere else, and you could recombine it later. But it's a standardized way of addressing a particular IIIF resource. And here I'm providing a transcription of a page of content. Uh, and here I'm providing maybe a piece of commentary. So you can see we have an image and I'm providing two annotations. One of them is an image annotation. Uh, it links off to an image. One of them is a comment on a piece of text. And what we're looking at is just code, but obviously if a client tool that understands these annotations can consume them, then it can render them in a more interesting viewing experience. And not only do we see the digitized object, but we see all the content that people have made about that object. And it's all interoperable because it comes it comes in the standardized format that viewers can, can fetch and consume. And I'm just going to show one last example of annotation before we move on to some examples from the Royal Botanical Garden. And this example is some work we've been doing uh, just recently for the National Library of Wales. And this shows an annotation environment. Uh, uh, we've been building this to allow people to come along to their digitized collections. They have lots and lots of stuff available as IIIF. They can configure a IIIF collection to be used in this platform, and then they can uh, make it available for annotation. Um, and here we have some rolls of film that have been digitized as part of a collection. And here we're having a kind of crowdsourcing project that is inviting people to contribute uh, notes on these, on these digitized objects. So for example, I could select one particular image to look at, and the annotation environment has been pre-configured with particular kinds of annotation to capture. And so I could say, OK, right, I want to identify a person. So I'm going to make a box selection, and I'm going to identify this person. And then I'm going to name that person. Uh, that person is, I'm just going to person X and her date of birth is so and so. Yeah. But the point about this is I've, I've defined a particular piece of information I want people to capture from images, and I've provided uh, a user interface for people to come along and, and do that. And they get saved as this standard form of annotation that is interoperable and consumable by anyone who, who builds a viewer that can render annotations conf that conform to this standard. 
Um, I'm going to pause for a moment there before we look at the Edinburgh examples, just to make sure, uh, see if there are any questions. Um, Tom, sorry, this is Elspeth. Um, just one one point is just very occasionally um, the sound's cutting out slightly. I'm not sure if it's just for me or if more people are, are hearing that. So I just wanted to, it's not too bad at the moment, but it, I don't know I, if anyone else is, ha is experiencing that problem. Is is anyone else experiencing that? I, I did notice, Elspeth, that you're... Some, that you were cutting out as well sometimes, but I don't know if that was the connection or not. Yeah. It's working fine from Glasgow here. That's great. If it's just me, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Are there any are there any questions about IIIF from what we've seen so far? I do I appreciate there's a quite a dense amount of material concentrated in that presentation. Okay. In that case, I uh, I will go and have a quick look at some of Elspeth's materials, and maybe uh, you could help talk through these. So here we have um, some material, uh, and I will uh, share these links afterwards because these are these are publicly available. You can go uh, well if you know where the URL is. And so what we've done here is taken some examples of uh, material from um, uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens and put them into our uh, triple IF compatible platform. And here we're looking at them in the universal viewer. Um, and you can see here that uh, I can view thumbnails for them. I can go and select an individual image. I can see the metadata that we've extracted from the catalog about these things. And as I mentioned before, this metadata is transparent as far as IIIF concern is concerned, but is obviously important to the end user. And we can zoom in and see uh, great stuff in great detail. This may not come across very well on the WebEx, but um, there's, you know, we, we, can, we can go into as much detail as we like for the, uh, Im, um, for the images. Um, we can see here that in this particular case, I've decided just arbitrarily to take uh, one of the spreadsheets that Elspeth sent me and turn it into a single manifest that contains around 70 individual uh, images. And we can see here that we can zoom into them and we could load these in, into an annotation environment and, and annotate them uh, and so on. Another example is uh, maybe a comparison of uh, the same uh, specimen distributed around different institutions. So here, each one of these, I think, 14 images is, is the same specimen, but they're uh, around you know, all over the place. And if we load those into uh, an annotation environment that supports multiple up views, then we can look at uh, different images at once and compare them. So if we, if we uh, zoom into this a bit more, we can say, okay, let's look at this, some of the detail here. And some of the detail here, we could we could say, uh, I want to load in this particular specimen from institution A, and this particular specimen from institution B, uh, and by doing that, I can I can look at the you know, I can compare things from around the world uh, from a compatible viewer, um, and some of the things that we might like to do uh, when we're um, viewing these specimens uh, is annotate them. And Elspeth, I don't know if you want to maybe describe your annotation examples. Um, I could do that, or I don't know if Hannah and Mark want to come in on those. I know they're in a different room, but I'm not sure if they've got the mic, mic's phone on. Okay. So, okay. So, I'm can you can you can you see that on the screen? Yes. So this is Hannah and Mark. Please feel free to come in at any point. 
Um, but these are some examples of Hannah's, Hannah's work where she's looking at particular characters from herbarium specimens and species. Um, and these can be used to cla either to classify the, the specimens or, in fact, to key them out. And I'm just going to pass over now to Hannah and Mark, they've joined me in, in here. Uh, this particular example was where you've got a specimen where it's quite difficult to see all the details because it's quite poorly pressed and everything's overlapping. So the idea being that you can um, annotate it with the characters once you've studied it carefully and then it's much easier to, to view those rather than having to extract them from the image itself every time. Yeah, so one of the things that could be done with something like this is um, you know, an annotation can take the form of anything. And if if you built a, uh, a an annotation environment that maybe could offer the user the ability to, say, draw a box around a particular specimen and then use a particular set of user interface components to specify each of you know, each of these different characteristics to, to specify which one of them applied to the specimen that had been selected for annotation, then you could use the tool to build up that metadata, share that metadata in whichever way you like. But it means that if all the institutions that are contributing content are using IIIF, then the same tool can be used to annotate all of them. And so, so the the kind of development effort goes into into building uh, just the annotation uh, models uh, and the particular pieces of user interface you want to capture these particular specialized forms of annotation in rather than building huge amounts of shared infrastructure and inventing standards for sharing digitized content and all that kind of stuff. Because the IIIF specifications and existing software takes care of getting the material into viewers where it can be annotated and it leaves you know, the specialization, the, the, the actual application that's different in each case because it's interesting and, and a good thing to do, it leaves that as, as the thing that needs to be developed rather than you know, this huge reinventing of, of vast amounts of infrastructure every, every time a project like this is done. Um, I'm just going to look at, I'm just going to load one of the other examples here. Uh, so in this example, you can see, and yeah, I, I'm just going to give my interpretation of this and then I can, I can, be, I can, I can be corrected. Uh, so here, the, the, the specimen is both having some of its characteristics classified visually by picking the right model from different uh, options that might pop up uh, uh, visually. And also it's being geographically classified by giving it a latitude and longitude so that it can be located on a, on a map. Uh, and similarly, in this example here, we can see that um, not only have parts of the specimen been classified according to that visual mechanism, but also some descriptive text has been written, some of the text has been selected and transcribed, some of the text has been selected and linked off to other articles or resources on the web or other, you know, other citations of that data. There's some geospatial information being, being, being recorded. Uh, maybe the user interface for that is some kind of map picker, or maybe it's just a box into which you type a known latitude and longitude, or maybe both. But again, the, by, by sharing the material, we can uh, um, standardize the way the, the material is, is conveyed to us and then specialize on the particular applications we want to build on top of that. Do you want to add anything to that description? So you were, you were breaking up an awful lot there, Tom, but I think we got the gist of it, and I think you covered the points very well. But the, yeah, the point of this is to, what we would like to do is to annotate images with the things that you've suggested, the geography or morphology, which just makes us able to curate them on a, on a screen or a canvas, as you said, and it makes them a lot more useful. So I think everything you said there was, was exactly what we would be looking for, yes. Okay, uh, and, and one application of that is, so, I mean, one thing that we're seeing quite a lot in the cultural heritage sector is, and in fact some of the projects we're working on right now, involve people coming along and annotating content and classifying it by topics and you know, effectively tagging it. And what that allows you to do is build up navigation and discovery interfaces 
by using those topics that people have contributed and tagged things with to drive navigation and discovery. And in a similar way, you could, you know, if you have enough material that's been annotated uh, in, uh, according to the criteria we can see on screen here, then you could use that information to, to basically query the database you're building up uh, to sh you know, sh show me all the specimens that have these three particular characteristics uh, that are from this particular part of the world. And rather than just getting specimen results as metadata, you're actually getting image results because you're getting not only the, the, you know, the, the original photograph, but the particular region of the photograph that, that has that specimen on it or has that particular feature that's been annotated on it. So it gives us the ability to uh, gather data in the form of annotations, put them in some bespoke system for querying, and then render the results of those queries visually in an interoperable way. So the information going in is, is, is according to a standard. The way the model is being captured is according to a standard. The specifics of the model in your morphology models here or the particular way you want to describe locations, they may or may not be conforming to a standard. Um, but that's, that's kind of up, up, up to you in that part of your application. And then, again, using um, search, you know, a standard search term, you could then share the results of queries or allow people to come up to your uh, collections in other viewing tools and query them and get the results of those queries conforming to, to particular standards. So it kind of concentrates those bits that need to be different because they're about what you think of the world. Uh, it, it concentrates those into, into the bespoke development and not having to reinvent everything else around it just to share images online and use rich viewing and annotation environments. And I think I think this, if I'm, if I can describe this one, I think this is an example of a comparison where you might have uh, multiple images on screen at once, uh, and they are each annotated with interesting information, and uh, a viewer will allow us to load m several in at once to compare them. Is that the correct interpretation of this, or have I got that one wrong? Yes. Yeah, so you're looking at a set of duplicate specimens there, and the idea being that all the characters won't be present on every single specimen, but in having them all side by side in your viewer, it's quite easy to see the characters from the same collection at one time, so you can really understand what the plant's doing. And, and similarly, do you want to describe this one? Uh, this one is just an example where you've got a, an article that's a protolog for a number of species, and so sometimes you find yourself flicking back and forth between uh, descriptions and holotypes and um, flicking from one document to another. So the idea of being able to have a representation of the one article where all these species are published, and then from that article, holotypes or isotypes and other specimens from that species and look at the original illustrations and where they're collected as well. Hmm. Yeah, and just to, just to reinforce the point that the, the, the mechanism by which all these things are linked and the mechanism by which they're displayed and the tools we can use to consume them can be shared and we can, you can, we can inherit the work of others both in terms of client-side technologies in viewing tools and annotation environments and in server-side technologies, in, in um, platforms for hosting AAA content, uh, search servers, image servers, all that stuff is standardized and it allows institutions, whether in cultural heritage or other sectors, to concentrate on building you know, the, the, the things that make them distinct, the things that are particularly about their collections or their areas of research. So the, obviously these examples here are kind of uh, uh, mock-ups to convey the kinds of annotation scenarios that might be required for this kind of material. But you know you can see here again, I'm already imagining interesting visual tools for classifying this content and saving the classifications into a standardized annotation server for reuse. So I'm just conscious we have five minutes before the end, so I really should uh, open the floor to any questions there. Yeah, so as I said, 
if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to, to ask those. Um, un you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you want to put it into the chat, then we can read out the question, and I'm sure um, Tom and the team will be able to see the questions there as well. Yeah, let me just... I'm just trying to avoid covering up the screen with the, the other bits of the user interface. Okay. So I guess one question I've got for the for the um, people um, joining us is: Do you see potential uses in your own institute and in particular projects and in collaborations that you could see you using this? Oh, it's with it's Quentin here. Hi. I can, I can definitely see how useful it is. I'm just wondering how I can fit it into what we already have, or whether do we have to rebuild everything we have already to accommodate this? Yeah, it's a good question, and I guess it's one that I'm not sure, but I think certainly at Edinburgh we're in a situation where we're looking at image management systems. Um. And I think I, I, my understanding is that if you choose an image management system that is IIIS compatible, it would, it's actually very easy to, to incorporate all of this into, into the institute. Um, and there's quite a selection of, of um, options that are IIIS compatible. But maybe uh, Tom would be able to answer that better. Yeah, I think that, that there are two parts to that question. So, um, first of all, is, make, is making the image services available so that we can we can do this deep zoom experience and we can uh, have standard triple F um, compatible images. And uh, as, as you say, there are an increasing number of uh, asset management system vendors, dams vendors, repository vendors, and many uh, makers who are making their systems triple F compatible. Um, there are other solutions whereby you could uh, have a triple F um, image server that reads the content from your uh, repository and makes that available as triple F endpoints, and that's that's an, uh, that's an approach that we've implemented for quite a few people. So those are the image services, but then the other part of it is the presentation API, the manifest. So the the triple F manifest that need to go out there in the world that describe your data in triple F form. And what the usual model for that is in uh, cultural heritage, uh, at least, is that those manifests are transformations of other formats. So you need some kind of engine that would transform, uh, you know, assemble the right information, pointing at the right images, put them in the right order, create a ma create manifest for them so that they can be be published out there in in the world. Um, and obviously. Uh, the number of collection management systems that will give you exactly the manifest you would like to share with the world is very limited at the moment because it's not really a, you know, it's, it's, it's much more of an in, in institution specific kind of thing how you want to present that material. Um, but again, there is lots and lots of software to help you do that and services that, that, that will help you do that. Um, and, you know, if, if, you know, if I think of the work we've done in various libraries, then what we tend to come along and do is convert you know, that, that kind of last layer of metadata, combine it with image services, publish the manifests, and then they're out there in the world for um, interoperability. Yeah, thanks for that one. So I think, uh, I think I need to learn a lot more about it. it are you going to post this presentation somewhere so we, I can rewatch it? Yes, yes, we can we can do that, and I, I'll also share um, some links to lots of other material about Triple IF that's out there. Thanks. That's great. Did, did anyone else have any thoughts about next steps? I mean, are people interested in exploring this further? I'm not getting any replies here, but I guess it's something that we can maybe take on further with the with the CTAF, the Digitalization Working Group, and the ISTC. We can now that we've seen this, we can maybe think how we want to if if 
if we want to explore it further and how we do that. Um, but certainly, if there's any other people who are interested, then um, you know, you can either join the CTAF groups or you can contact myself or um, for more information about what's happening. As, as best, um, here's Anton speaking from Berlin. Hi, Anton. Can you hear me? Actually, yes. I, I just wanted to say we are definitely interested to explore this further. And um, the question is where to start. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the first steps really are. So I, I think best would be to discuss this a little bit further, for example, in the context of the ISTC with a couple of institutions who also want to do the first steps and do this together somehow. But I, I, actually, I'm, I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think knowing where... Sorry. Sorry, as, as Quentin said, we have a running uh, industry here at the BGBM, for example, and uh, we, I guess the first step would be to, to check whether it's already IIIF compliant, and then and if it's not, see whether we can kind of put up some kind of wrapper service thing, or I don't know. We have to see. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are a wide variety of strategies that have been adopted to get people uh, onto IIIF fairly quickly, but yeah, I, I'm not going to cover them in this short time we've had today. But um, yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat. If, uh, just, uh, there's a, uh, Mike is asking, uh, curious as to where annotations end up. If I publish something that others annotate, where will I find those annotations? Well, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so if an institution provides an annotation server and advertises an endpoint that people can contribute to, then you can publish them there. If you make your own annotations and store them in your own annotation server, uh, then how do you how do you let the world know about them? Um, and that's an area of active kind of concern or, or interest at the moment in the Triplife community about how do, we, how do we tell each other about all the wonderful enrichments we're making to each other's content? Um, what notification mechanisms should exist for me to tell you that I have new information about your stuff that you might want to fetch from me and incorporate into your, uh, you know, in, into your data? Uh, and there are various models for doing this. Uh, the, uh, certainly, the, in the manuscript world, people are, people have been developing some interesting solutions to this problem that would apply in other domains as well. Okay. Was there any other questions in the chat, Tom? That I that I've missed. Uh, other than things about sound cutting out, yes. uh, Sarah Phillips says interested but need to investigate a bit more. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, I appreciate that one hour is a, a short space of time to convey the, the possibilities of this, of these standards and this, you know, this what what, what interoperability of content and and presentation mess data actually c could allow for. There's all sorts of things that we could do with this. Yeah, well, I think as a community, I think it would be great if we can start exploring it now and and see if it's if it's going to work for us. I think that'd be great. So, I think we'll we'll start doing that. Um, but I think if there's if there's nothing else, I think we should maybe just um, stop there because I'm conscious of time. Yeah. Um, and I really, Tom, I'd really like to thank you very much indeed for for the presentation. Um, it's been fascinating. It's been really inspiring. I hope everyone's been seen something that they think that they might be able to use in the future as well. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom.